workers uh, were working in two or three different care settings and they inadvertently brought the virus into the homes. As the COVID-19 death toll continues to climb in long-term care homes, there are new questions about whether enough is being done to protect vulnerable seniors. Good evening, I'm Mike Wise. Thank you to our viewers in Windsor for tuning in tonight. Ontario is now reporting at least 119 deaths related to COVID-19 among residents of seniors' homes. Now, despite that alarming number, the Ford government is defending its moves for preventing the spread of the virus in long-term care. Our Queen's Park reporter, Mike Crawley, has that story. This is the Eatonville long-term care home in Etobicoke. Family members of three different residents tell CBC News they received a phone call last night with a recorded message from the home's director announcing that 14 residents have died. That was shocking. Jacqueline Mitchell's 93-year-old mother, Lena, is in the home. Where did this information come from all of a sudden? But that's the first We time told the premier about the phone calls from the home. A recorded message. That's, again, I, I, I don't want to knock the home because I, I don't know their, their situation, but I don't know. Kind of seems cold. Management at the Eatonville Long-Term Care Centre did not respond to CBC's calls and emails about the 14 reported deaths. As for Toronto's top uh, doctor... I'm afraid I don't have the specific details with me now on, on uh, the uh, long-term care home you're speaking of at Eatonville. There are now COVID-19 outbreaks in at least 89 long-term care homes in this province, and the deaths keep mounting. While the Pinecrest Nursing Home in Bob Cajun has seen more deaths than any other facility in the province, multiple homes are reporting eight deaths or more. Experts suggest elderly residents who died this weekend were likely infected in late March. That's after the province declared a state of emergency and restricted access to seniors' facilities. So how did the infections happen? Part of the explanation is that um, some of the workers uh, were working in two or three different care settings and they inadvertently brought the virus into the homes. This health care union leader says the government's initial measures on long-term care homes should have been tougher. And early on we said you can't uh, just recommend and provide guidelines. You have to be firmer than that. You have to put in orders. We could look look backwards and, and point out every single little, little item. I'm, I'm sure there's areas in, in this whole uh, pandemic that uh, could have, should have, would have. And uh, I feel we, we're, we're doing everything we can right now. Long-term care and retirement homes across the province are now reporting more than 740 confirmed cases of COVID-19 among residents, and 430 among staff. The death toll has now hit 119. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. We have an update tonight on the Markham Home for Adults with Physical and Developmental Disability that's been hit by a COVID-19 outbreak. We have currently 12 residents who have been um, confirmed positive with COVID-19 um, and we have six staff uh, who have tested positive to date. Last week, a number of staff at the facility walked off the job over concerns about the outbreak. One of those workers has since returned, but Participation House is still critically low on skilled staff. Executive Director Shelley Brillinger says they have had an overwhelming response to the call for help, with nurses from across the country offering their services. Participation House also put out a call for personal protective equipment. They say they have enough to last through the week, but are still working to obtain more. Participation House is also getting some help from a former Liberal MP for Markham Stouffville, Jane Philpott. Philpott was a family doctor before entering politics, and when the pandemic began, she renewed her medical license and is now lending support to the home. Well, during this crisis, few of us have been able to see what healthcare workers are facing firsthand. But tonight, we can offer you a glimpse. The National got rare access to the ER and ICU at Toronto's Humber River Hospital. And co-host Adrienne Arsenault followed a healthcare team through a full shift. She joins us now to talk about what she witnessed. So, Adrian, what is the situation at Humber River? Well, Mike, it's interesting. You know, there are 31 COVID patients there now. And that's an interesting number because Thursday there were 18. Over the weekend, some 27. So what you're seeing there is a steady climb, but you're not seeing the spike. So they are taking some solace 
in that. Uh, it, that could suggest that the slope is not as terrifying in the hospital at the moment as, as all of us have feared, but it might also suggest, and what worries them, is that people are deteriorating and sometimes dying at home or in homes before they ever get to the hospital. So there's a fair amount of, of stress in that hospital. I can tell you that because the testing rates have been so low, when someone comes into the ER, they have no idea if that person is COVID positive or not. So they have to presume they are, and that's how they burn through uh, the PPE. It is enormously stressful for them. One curiosity though, Mike, is that it doesn't really appear to be that chaotic an ER. You're not getting as many car accidents, not as many injuries. So some per sometimes people are perhaps afraid maybe to go to the ER. So y you have these periods where it looks relatively calm. There are some empty bays and then everybody focuses in because someone is coming in and the great big fear is that they have COVID-19. Now, uh, how are the staff coping with that fear on the job? Well, sorry, I just just a heads up. I know I'm not doing the weather report. It is incredibly windy out here in Toronto. Um, I would tell you that the staff are very nervous. Uh, they're nervous for themselves. They're nervous that the PPE will run out. But the thing that I didn't expect to, to hear from them was the level of emotion they feel for Canadians, for the people who can't be there with their families. It's an important part of medicine to be with a family member when someone is going through something terrible, to answer the questions, to sit with them, to look them in the eye and explain what's going on. And that can't happen anymore. This is a hospital without visitors or flowers or balloons. And, and the absence of that is really difficult. It places an extra burden or responsibility on the healthcare workers. We spoke with Dr. Uh, Taslim Nimji, an ER physician at Humber River, uh, about how difficult that is. Have a listen to what she said. It's hard. You're on the phone and you're wearing all this equipment and you're having a very rushed and hurried conversation with a loved one to give them a quick update or to find out what their wishes are for the person that they love that's just come to the hospital so that you can honor those wishes. And you're partly, your, your voice is muffled. When somebody's sitting here in front of me and I can talk about what's happening in the room with their loved one, and I can pause and just look into their eyes and say, do you have any questions? And let them guide that conversation. It's entirely different. That's two human beings connecting. And so Dr. Nimji added that she wants people to know that they are doing everything they can for the people you love and that you can't be there hurts them very much. I can tell you, Mike, from just one shift in the ER and ICU there observing them, the sense of respect and responsibility they have uh, is really acute. Some great access there. Adrian, thank you for joining us uh, on a very windy balcony tonight. Uh, thank you, Adrian. <laughs> yeah. And you can see Adrian's full story from inside the ER and ICU at Humber River Hospital. That's tonight at 9 o'clock on CBC News Network, 10 o'clock right here on CBC Television. An Ottawa company has received the green light from Health Canada for its COVID-19 test kit. Uh, so what that means is we are now allowed to start shipping. So this week we are going to start shipping to the federal and provincial governments. Spartan Bioscience was able to adapt its portable DNA kit to a handheld cube-shaped device. Now it can be used to do quick tests for the virus in places such as airports, border crossings and remote communities. CEO Paul Lem says the tests involve taking a swab and then plugging it into a coffee cup-sized cube, which lights up if the sample is positive for COVID-19. The process takes less than an hour. With Health Canada's approval, Spartan Bioscience can now start shipping thousands of units. In the next call it a week or two, it'll be in the thousands of tests per week. Then it ramps up to around 10,000 tests per week. Then in probably three or four months, it goes up to 100,000 or more tests per week. Spartan was one of the companies that received federal funds in mid-March to help in the fight against COVID-19. A refugee shelter near Young and Finch is reporting a COVID-19 outbreak. The virus is affecting both staff and clients at a building run by Homes First. Ali Chasson has the latest. It was Thursday night and, um, and we had uh, one or two and then it went to four. Since then, it's shot up to 23 cases at the Homes First refugee shelter. 12 uh, staff that have been tested positive and confirmed by Toronto Public Health as well as 11 uh, residents in this building. 
They have been removed and are being treated in isolation. The rest of the people who live there have to continue to abide by the rules, wash hands, keep their distance. We have signs everywhere, we have education, we're making announcements at meals, reminding people to hand wash. Oh, it's definitely just the tip of the iceberg. Street nurse Kathy Crow warns if this has happened at homes first, it could happen elsewhere. You cannot um, protect people in a pandemic in shelters. They need to be one person per room. The city has been moving homeless people into hotel rooms over the last couple of weeks, but Crow says it's not happening fast enough. The city says it's an ongoing effort. We've been successful in moving over 1,000 people so far, um, and we will continue those efforts until we are able to create that physical distancing uh, right across the sector. A way to bring testing to the shelters is also something being looked at. We have been proactively asking our provincial partners for priority testing for individuals who are homeless um, and also proactive testing as well to, to help us understand how this uh, virus is moving through the shelter system. Back at the Willowdale Homes First shelter, they're feeling like they're running out of time to manage the outbreak. We are kind of like at the bottom of the food chain. We need masks, we need personal protective equipment as well, and we hope some people can think of us when, they, when they're making their donations. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. The City of Toronto is opening two more emergency child care centres for essential and critical service workers. More than 200 children are presently in these 24-7 child care centres, which have rigorous health precautions in place in an effort to respect physical distancing. I commend our staff for working so quickly with our partners at the province of Ontario to scale up these emergency child care services for essential and critical service workers and their families. Mayor Tory says the city received authorization from the province to open the licensed child care centres. They'll be located in existing city-run licensed facilities and staffed by City of Toronto child care workers. Now, they are in addition to four centres announced at the end of March. The first one, located on Bathurst Street, opens today. And the second, located on the Danforth, will open later this week. A new mother in Windsor has been floored by the support shown by her community. Nicole Bitzer gave birth about a month earlier than expected. She came home from hospital this weekend to find donations at her front door. It just went from like something small to like a big forest fire. I have like, I don't even need to people just worry. Drop stuff off right just now. Yeah, people just drop some things off right now. So the only thing I have to worry about is getting mom healthy and making sure Abella's healthy and gets to come home. Well, this is baby Abella here. Bitzer calls her a miracle baby. She needed a blood transfusion, but is doing well. The family says she's making progress, and here's a look at some of what was dropped off over the weekend, courtesy a donation drive that was started by her sister. Well, we are keeping an eye on some flooding in southwestern Ontario. Take a look at the situation in Lighthouse Cove on Lake St. Clair near Chatham today. Colette joins us after the break with a look at your forecast for the week. We'll be right back.
Colette Kennedy joins us now with a look at our Easter Monday forecast. And Colette, you almost got scooped earlier in the newscast. Adrian mm. Arsenault was on reporting from a balcony. There were hair just whipping around, just showing how strong the wind is this evening. Absolutely. If you didn't know there were wind warnings in place, you could see it right there as Adrian stood on that balcony. So we have the wind warnings for all the areas you see in orange. So it's in eastern Ontario, southwestern Ontario, along the lakeshore, and around Lake St. Clair, and up around Georgian Bay. And as well, the flooding issues you shot saw the images a little earlier in our newscast there. Essex Regional Conservation Authority issuing those flood warnings for those areas we continue to see problems with with the high water levels, but it comes in off the lake when we get these very strong winds. Speaking of strong winds, these are the gusts we're looking at in many cases over 70 kilometers an hour, including in Toronto, and we've been seeing that back towards Windsor as well. They backed off a little bit, but still very strong winds. In those warning areas, we could see gusts of 80 to 90 kilometers an hour. So earlier it was much milder 15 degrees earlier today in Toronto still hanging on at 15 in the nation's capital and it was 12 degrees earlier in Windsor but you see as the front has gone through that's kicked up these winds it's bringing those temperatures down as well the rainfall moving away snow heavy snow left behind in northeastern Ontario some areas 30 to 50 centimeters but for us these winds will be backing off overnight so through the evening hours we'll still be contending with the warnings and those very strong gusts and then tomorrow still breezy but we're talking about wind gusts around 40 kilometers an hour, maybe at times pushing towards 50, but not like we're seeing for this evening. Also, it will be a drier day, a little bit of moisture, and we may see a bit of light mixed precipitation. It will be very scattered in nature. There should be some sunshine in there as well. Overnight tonight for southwestern Ontario, much cooler, minus two. Highs tomorrow, also cooler, five to six degrees. Tonight around the GTA, we're looking at those readings basically around the freezing mark, and then and six degrees for tomorrow for the high. A few days we're going to be seeing these temperatures running just below freezing. We warm up, though, Mike, as we head towards the weekend. How about that? That is something to look forward to. Thanks, Colette. You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Good news is a little harder to come by these days. So here's a happy story for you. Despite having shut down all of their service during the COVID-19 pandemic, Sunwing Airlines has found a way to help people in need. Greg Ross tells us how. With all of their planes grounded, Sunwing Airlines is unable to give people a lift these days, but that's not stopping them from trying to lift people's spirits. We saw an opportunity where we had some food that was potentially going to be going off during the time we're suspending operation. I thought, uh, what better time for us to do something good and donate that food? Sunwing Airlines president Mark Williams says they've donated tens of thousands of meals that were supposed to be used on flights headed all over the world. Now they're being sent to homes across Canada. 46,000 meals uh, from Vancouver to St. John's. The meals are being distributed through a charity called Second Harvest. CEO Lori Nichols says it couldn't have come at a better time. Certainly there's a lot more people that need food. There's a lot of uncertainty. And all of the food is pre-prepared, which means they'll be able to get it out a lot easier and quicker. We'll get these meals out between 24 and 48 hours. And in terms of quality... It is airline food, I mean. <laughs> They've come a long way. You know, people like to joke about uh, airline food, but, you know, we partnered with uh, Lynn Crawford as an example, and one of the items we're donating is a croque monsieur sandwich, breakfast sandwich. Uh, and we're also donating um, Schwartz's Deli uh, smoked meat sandwiches as well. Second Harvest is sending food to 200 different charitable organizations in Toronto alone, including shelters, food banks and churches. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. My biggest thing is I can't work with my students. Like I can't move anything, I can't feel anything, they can't touch my hand and so Everything has to rely on sound. Keeping the music lessons going online will bring you that story coming up. Plus, today's frontline hero. That's all after the break.
Well, for kids in Ontario, schooling has, for the most part, gone digital, and so too have other kinds of lessons. We want you to meet a group of Toronto musicians who are all living under one roof, who are continuing to teach their students the art of music during the COVID-19 pandemic. Wow, good work, you guys. That's so good. My name is Kaylee, and I've been teaching violin performance for 10 years. Nathan, my husband, has been running jazz guitar lessons on it with his boss, and he teaches on Zoom all the time. So it was sort of a no, I didn't even really think about it, honestly. I just, you know, it was just sort of, I went into survival mode and was like, we gotta do this. <laughs> was the one who kicked off the really, the, the practical end of it. And she said, hey, Tina and Erica, you know, do you people want to come and meet on the, uh, around the kitchen table on Saturday night? Maybe Nathan can talk to us about teaching online because I think maybe we're going to have to start doing this. And I said, okay. Never done anything online before. I have to learn like in a day or two, basically. Together, we looked at a bunch of different forums and asked other musicians uh, through our various networks. The biggest struggle for me switching over has really been changing everything I rely on for teaching. Um, I'm a very kinesthetic teacher. I like to have even my students will like ride their bow arms on my arm to feel what it is. And my biggest thing is I can't work with my students. Like I can't move anything. I can't feel anything. They can't touch my hand. And so everything has to rely on sound. Because my demographic has gotten older in the last few years, um, some of them are a little bit hesitant about, about technology, but I'm surprised how many, even just in the last few days, are deciding they're going to give it a try because they love to sing so much. Well, it took a little bit to get organized in terms of setting up the camera for the students. I don't need to see their face. I need to see their hands and their position at the piano. So that was a little bit complicated. Of course, it's how I make my living, so I have to keep teaching for that as well. But really, I feel we are a community and we have to stay together. And it's, it's my responsibility to do that, to, to keep us all together. This has been a, a lifesaver in many ways. Teaching has you know, given us a sense of normality. Now that this has happened and people are, are stuck in their homes more and more, I think that a lot of people are seeking connection with a lot of people in ways that they can't usually have it. And honestly, that's why we, most of us, get into music in the first place, which is to connect with other people. Well, it is Easter Monday, so for today's Frontline Hero feature, we're bringing you a sweet story. The owner of an Oshawa shortbread company has decided to put together a free thank you gift for essential workers. One thing people can always find comfort in, she says, is baked goods. Here's more on her offer. Hi there, I'm Trisha Bauer from Eat My Shortbread, and I wanted to talk to you briefly about a very special project that I've created as a way of giving back to our community members. It's called Thank You, your real lifesaver stash box. This initiative is for frontline healthcare workers and essential services workers. If you know someone, or maybe it's you, that's working in this field right now, I want you to go to my website, eatmyshortbread.com, fill out a nomination form, and send that to me. Every person that is nominated will receive one of these boxes. In the box, you will find butter tarts, shortbread base, and of course shortbread. All of these boxes contain donated baked goods, as well as a very special treat from a local maker. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at any time at info at eatmyshortbread.com. Thank you. Well, thank you for everything you're doing. If you'd like to share a story about your frontline hero, send us a selfie style video explaining why they are a hero to you. Tag us on Twitter or Instagram at CBC Toronto. You can send us a message on Facebook or email us at torontotips at cbc.ca. That's our newscast for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Power and Politics is coming up next. Good night.